There's obviously a multitude of reasons as to why Liverpool is having so much success these days. I mean, they haven't lost a Premier League match in over a year. Success is down to a mixing pot of coaching, proper training, player personnel, scouting, and intelligent recruitment, not to mention luck and the effort to manifest it for yourself. But the one thing that connects all of these aspects in Liverpool's case is their extensive focus on the use of analytics and data to improve every aspect of the club's performance, from optimizing their possession retention from throw-ins, to seeing how a new signing can increase their goal probability, to employing analytics for corporate measures. This is a brief intro to how they are leading the charge in the data sphere. Well, relatively brief, as I could go on forever. But hey there, I'm Adrian, and welcome to Rabona TV. Glad you joined us, and if you enjoy the content, then consider subscribing for more. And hey, thank you to everyone who had previously suggested I do a video on Liverpool's use of data, including Satria. I love when I get the chance to do a video on something you guys have directly requested, so leave your suggestions. Before we look at how Liverpool can apply all of these techniques in regards to tactics and on-the-pitch implementation, let's look at how these analytics are applied to Liverpool's decisions in regards to the transfer market, arguably data's biggest contribution at the club. Ian Graham graduated from Cambridge University with a doctorate in theoretical physics and has been with Liverpool since July of 2012. And he has a remarkable amount of data at his fingertips. Graham uses this data to build up a database of Klopp's players. Their passing patterns, their percentages, their knack for receiving the ball in dangerous areas, the most detailed records, match by match, minute by minute. But of course his database doesn't stop at Liverpool and other Premier League clubs, as Graham and his team track over 100,000 different players' data from around the world. Graham constructed his database to allow for Liverpool's recruitment to customize their player search based on specific parameters. However, in speaking to the Freakonomics podcast, Graham broke down how he and the rest of the research department have been able to merge a few different analytical markers into one currency, as he put it. Quote, we try to take whatever action a player does on a pitch, whether it's a pass or a shot or a tackle, if you're a defender, and ask the question, what was this team's chance of scoring a goal before this action happened? And then, what was this team's chance of scoring a goal after the action happened? And we call that goal probability added, which is a really catchy name. Rolls off the tongue beautifully. Goal probability added. Graham then started to talk about how he personally has an obsession with the notion of risk versus reward for every action that a player makes. And this can be applied to literally anything, a pass or a shot going forward, or even a tackle for the defensive side of things. In fact, this just goes to prove something even more further that we all sort of fall for at one point, stats don't tell the entire story, and in fact, how stats can be limiting in some cases. Let's say you're looking at the pass completion rate of a certain player. If you wanted to find a player with a high pass conversion rate, you would help yourself out by looking at a team that plays it out of the back, and more specifically, take a look at their central defenders and defensive midfielders. Given that these players are constantly making short passes to each other, forwards, backwards, side to side, forward and diagonally to the back again, their pass conversion rate will always be high, but there isn't much risk in these passes. For lack of a better term, these stats would be padded, though of course unintentionally. As Graham tells the Freakonomics podcast, quote, some of the best passers in the game have some of the lowest pass completion percentages in the game. And that's because the risk reward payoff is very, very skewed in football. So it's very easy to massage your statistics and get a high pass completion percentage by playing very conservative passes that do nothing for your team's chance of scoring a goal. The passes I really love are the passes that go in behind the opposition defense that take four or five defenders out of the game. Those passes are really hard to make. Someone who gets those passes correct half of the time would be a world-class attacking midfielder. By taking this into account, you find players like Andy Robertson, perhaps the best left back in the world today. Besides my Canadian brother, Alfonso Davies, of course. <laughs> Sorry, but anyway. Graham himself highlighted Andy Robertson and how the scouting of him was aided by this sort of analytical currency, the risk versus reward. Certainly he wasn't completing all of his passes that he attempted while he was with Hull, as he was a gifted attacking left back playing in an extremely defensive team, and a poor one at that. But even so, he showed much promise in this area, though it was often overlooked due to the fact that he was playing for a relegation-bound club, and he was, in Graham's words, not mine, <laughs> one of those, quote, 
awkward, ungainly looking players that have been overlooked for various other reasons. You can see how this would be vital, as just as you can see the goal probability added for players going forward, the inverse is vital in signing defensive players. Every action they perform, every tackle, headed clearance, block shot, areas of the pitch that they are making their tackles, you name it. All of it could be used to filter through Graham's database. Graham and his department played a massive role in the signing of Jurgen Klopp. Not just a data junkie, Graham has a passion for football, of course, and he and his team identified with Klopp's passion as a potential replacement should things go awry with Brendan Rodgers. Narrator, things did go awry. Well, Graham, his team, and the owners of Liverpool liked heavy metal, if you catch my meaning, and from what they had seen of Klopp at Dortmund, his ethos seemed like a perfect fit for that of Liverpool. Like he could be the man to bring Liverpool back to glory, unite the club with the fans, and get them moving forward together again. All of that sounded great, but detractors would point to his final season with Dortmund and try to claim that he had lost a bit of magic, given that Dortmund had finished in seventh. Again, speaking to Freakonomics, Graham had this to say in regards to how they couldn't look past Klopp. Quote, His last season at Dortmund was disastrous, so they were in the relegation zone, and the German media said it's all over for Dortmund. Klopp's lost it, and there's no way back for them. Our analysis showed something quite different which was that they were still clearly the second best team in Germany, but the performances did not match the results. So I analyzed 10 seasons of Bundesliga performances, and Dortmund were the second unluckiest team in that 10 year history. It was just some terrible luck that cost Jürgen that one season. See what I mean about luck playing a big part of it? Klopp was amazed at how through this data, Graham could give minute, detail to every pass completed, pass failed, shot, close opportunity, occasion where a goal should have been scored, occasions where the opponents were extremely lucky to score, everything. All without ever watching a single match from Klopp's final season. And this is what led to Klopp being one of the few coaches in the game that is so willing to adopt data and analytics to apply them to the management of the team at every level. Going further with Freakonomics, Graham said, quote, I mean, data analysis, because it's new and because football is a very conservative sport, it's something that is difficult to get across. And it's very understandable for a manager who has a hundred other things to worry about to just say, you know what? I'm not interested in this. But Jurgen Klopp took the time and was kind enough to let me explain our approach. He understood it and appreciated it, which already puts him in the top 5% of managers, in my opinion. For our last section here, I'm using squad performance as a catch-all term for how they directly use data in their management of the squad. <laughs> Everything from injury prevention thanks to the performance data they collect from practices and matches, to on-field implementation, opponent scouting, analysis, everything. As mentioned in the New York Times article, which I will link to in the description below along with my other sources, not all bits of data and analysis are being thrown at players on a daily basis. They aren't given some computer readout for them to memorize prior to matches like a data crunching computer. The research team feeds information that they think is useful to Klopp, and he deems what is worth passing on to the team and adapts a way to translate that into a mechanic of their approach or a tactic during the game. For example, You've likely seen this video that circulated of Liverpool data analyst Tim Waskett appearing on BBC's Royal Institution Christmas Lectures this past Christmas. And in this demonstration, he spoke of goal probability and, well, as he said, quote, It's our job to turn every action on the pitch, every pass, every throw in, every tackle, every shot into a goal probability. By looking at where the shots take place and how often they became a goal, it gives us a probability of a shot from a similar situation becoming a goal. Okay, so you figured out where the key areas are, but how do you best get to those key areas? For this, Waskett and the team use technology that gives a very odd representation of the entire match. In this image, which looks akin to something a weatherman would use, you can see the Liverpool players as red circles and their opponents as blue circles. The arrows signify which direction the players are heading in, while the red areas that look like a horrendous heat wave rolling in are in fact the areas of the pitch that Liverpool players can get to before their opponents. In essence, it maps out the ideal areas of the pitch to play the ball to, and the areas that will be best covered defensively as well. The more red it is, the more likely a Liverpool player is to reach it before their opponent. Now, given that, as Waskett says, quote, 
For roughly 200 games per weekend, we get data involving every single ball touch in the game. And for every game, we get approximately 2,000 ball touch events. So that means that Liverpool isn't just analyzing their own matches, but the matches of their opponents. Just think of that. They have all of this data at their disposal with a team of physicists, astrophysicists, and psychologists studying it and creating models that show where a team is at their weakest, where they leave space for exploitation, where they most commonly attack, and when in the match they do all of this. Plus, it goes further. In fact, the data seemingly never ends. <laughs> as Liverpool's research department can pinpoint the fittest players on opposing teams and when their stamina is expected to drop off. And in knowing all of this, it now makes sense as to how airtight Liverpool have been and how inevitable they have become when it comes to scoring and, of course, winning matches. But in saying all of this, I have to stress that it's one thing to have access to all of this data, and it's another thing entirely for a coach to one, be willing to implement it, and two, know when to utilize it and when not to. Beyond that, another thing entirely again, to have the personnel that are capable of following these instructions and the aptitude to execute them. I hope that you enjoyed this quick glance at a few ways Liverpool are changing the analytics game in football as early adopters. If you did enjoy it, feel free to subscribe or simply leave a like at the door. I'm Adrian, I love you, and take care.